Lecture 1, Introduction to Operations Management. In this lecture, we're going to define operations management. We'll talk about the difference between a goods or services. We'll uh, introduce you to the supply chain. Um, we'll talk about the transformational process. Uh, we'll cover the evolution of operations management. And we'll talk about environmental and ethical issues. And finally, we're going to talk about supply chain management and issues. So what is operations? So operations is really what you do as a business. It's the part of the business organization that's responsible for producing goods or services. So if you are a restaurant, it is making and serving food. Um, if you are a automobile manufacturer, it is producing a good, which is the car. So how do we define operations management? It's the management of systems or processes that creates the goods or provides the services. So here's some examples of goods versus services. So goods includes everything from raw materials to partially assembled uh, something to the final product. So uh, an example is, uh, is your car. Your car is a goods. Um, the computer, so the computer that you're using to watch this video, that is a goods. Uh, an oven where you bake something. Shampoo, those are all goods. Services are activities that provide some combination of time, location, form, or psychological value. So for example, air travel. So the service of air travel is to get you from one town to another town. You're actually using a goods, which is the airplane, to get there, but your purpose isn't, you're not buying an airplane, you're just simply buying the air travel. Uh, education. This class is a great example of a service. You are um, learning something here. A haircut. Uh, your hair grows. You need to go get a haircut. Um, your haircut is at a specific time and location. Legal counsel. You need to go get a lawyer. That's a service. So here's the supply chain. It's the sequence of activities and organizations that produce or deliver a goods or services. So you start on the left with supplier suppliers. That's someone that your suppliers get stuff from. Then you have direct suppliers. Then the producer. You are the producer. You're making something. Now that, um, that product, service, whatever it is, has to be distributed. So there's a distributor, and then you have the final customers. So that's the supply chain, and we'll, we'll be covering this a lot throughout the class. Now this is the transformational process. This is where you add value. This is, this is really what you do. So on the left, you have inputs. Uh, could be land, labor, capital, information. Um, raw materials, whatever it is, then you go through some kind of a transformational process and on the output is either a goods or services. Now you have these feedback loops where you're always looking to see if there's something about your product or service that needs to be improved in your transfer transformational process you, you, you also have feedback to your inputs um, to say what is it that we need to do different. So, so an example on an input. Let's say you're a restaurant. So your inputs are your building, uh, your labor, the, the cook, the servers, it's, and then it's your food. So you might get a delivery um, of lettuce and tomatoes and beans and rice. Those are all inputs. So the transformational concert, conversion process is where you take those things. A cook makes that into food and then a server serves that to a customer. 
And so that's the transformational process and the output. Now the, the feedback is uh, the cook on the right hand side, uh, the customer says this something's wrong with this food, it doesn't taste right or I don't like it. That's feedback goes back in and they may say okay I'll make you something different or make you something better or try again. That would be feedback. Now you if, if you got a box of lettuce and the entire box of lettuce is rotten, now that's that goes back to feedback to your lettuce supplier of, of your input. So that's sort of how the, the whole thing works, this transformational process. So here's the uh, goods and services continuum. Um, a lot of products are not purely a service or a goods, they're, they're sort of a combination. So for example, automobile assembly and steel making, those are mostly goods, but there is a small amount of service in there. Home remodeling, retail sales, have a little bit more service, computer repair, a restaurant meal. So in a restaurant meal, it's really half of it is the food, you're eating food, which is a goods, but you have a server, they're, they're transforming this food for you, they're, it's a certain time that you're eating it which, is, it, which is the service side of it. A songwriting software development starts getting into more into services, surgery, teaching. You start getting into mostly services with just a small amount of, of goods. So why study operations management? So every aspect of business affects or is affected by operations. So many service jobs are closely related to operations. So financial services, marketing services, accounting services, information, all of those are very closely related to operations. And so when you learn about operations and supply chain, you will have a better understanding of where we live, the whole world, global dependencies of companies and nations. Um, you'll also understand why uh, companies succeed or fail and the importance of working with others. So there's three basic functions of any organization and that is marketing, operations, and finance. So marketing is, is um, the part that goes and identifies customers, brings customers in. Operations is the, the part that actually makes something or does something. And finance is, is collecting the money, managing the money, all of those. Now there's overlap between these three areas. For example, under finance and operation, uh, uh, finance is responsible for budgeting the operations. They, they provide the economic analysis of an investment proposal. Let's say that you say, well, we should, we should uh, have a new restaurant. Okay, so that new restaurant, it, what, how much is it going to cost? What's the return on investment? Those kinds of things. And then they provide the funds. So finance is responsible for, for providing the funds to pay for your servers or your cook pay for the food, all of those. And then marketing has an impact with operations. So marketing is responsible for providing demand data. So we're gonna have this restaurant. Marketing is responsible to analyze how many people we think will come to that restaurant at what time. Uh, product and service design. So marketing is responsible to tell operations the kinds of things that are important to the customer. Marketing does the competitor analysis. So we look at a restaurant, we want to put a restaurant over on Main Street. Well, marketing will go over there and look and say, well, you know, there's, there's another restaurant that does the same thing as us and, and we'll have to compete head to head. That might not be the best location. They're looking at the competitors. Lead time data. So marketing is responsible for promising customers the product on a certain time, but they need to work with operations 
because they, they the state it might be normally when you place an order will provide it in a week but maybe operations has a backlog and they need to go tell marketing uh, you know the lead time for this is really going to be two weeks because we, we have too much to do operations management and supply chain career opportunities so here's some jobs that you could have that are directly related to operations management it can be an operations manager supply chain manager production analyst schedule coordinator production manager industrial engineer purchasing manager inventory manager or quality control all of those are very closely related to operations management there's some professional suppliers for operations management uh, APICS Association for Operations Management uh, ASQ American Society for Quality Institute for Supply Management then you have INFORMS Institute for Operations Research and Management Science uh, POMS Production and Operation Management Society uh, PMI the Project Management Institute and then the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. So these are some of the professional societies. So let's talk about process management. So there's three categories of business processes. There's the other upper management process. These government the govern the entire operation of the organization. Operational processes, these are like the core processes and then supporting processes. Then supply and demand. So the operations and supply chain are responsible for meeting the supply. Sales and marketing is responsible for um, identifying demand, creating demand. So if you have way more supply than you have demand, that's wasteful and costly. Uh, costly. If you say, well, we're going to have a hundred people coming in the restaurant, we have to make a lot of food, and then you only have ten, and all that, uh, all that extra food, um, some of it is is not going to be able to be used used tomorrow. So that that becomes wasteful. So uh, that's where you have way more supply than demand, or maybe you order a bunch of lettuce and then it's rotten before you can serve it. And then the other one is where supply is way less than demand. I don't know if you've ever walked into a restaurant, you see something on the menu, you say, I'd like to order this um, burger. And they're like, oh, we're sorry, uh, we ran out of that. And so then you go somewhere else on the menu, like, okay, okay, I'll take my second choice, I'll take this. It's, oh, sorry, we're out of that too. And, and so here, and you know, so the customer is dissatisfied and maybe they go down to a third item, let's get this instead, and it's like, uh, no, we're out of that too. Um, so at that point, the customer may actually just leave. It's like, no, I can't get anything here. So you've lost the opportunity to sell anything to that customer. You have a dissatisfied customer, they might not come back next time. So on the bottom is the idea where supply equals demand. So you have the exact right amount of products or services for the demand. Process variation. So there's four sources of process variation. Um, so the first is the variety of goods or services being offered. So when you have a large variety, that that creates variation in your processes. So if if you have low variety, if you have like a cook that's just, just um, making burgers, and they only have one kind of burger, um, one kind of topping, the process is always the same. You make a burger by doing this. It's always the same. But then if you if you say, we, we offer everything, then the process to make the food is different depending on whether they're making soup, or salad, or a burger. Um, all of those have a different process. And then there's structural variation in, in demand. So these um, are generally predictable variation. So an example is a restaurant. Restaurants have um, 
a structural variation. Lunchtime, you have a bunch of people and supper, you have a bunch of people and there's not so many people in between. So those are very predictable and maybe on Monday night you don't have very many customers on Friday night and Saturday night you may have a whole bunch. So those are um, examples of structural variation. And random variation are natural variation um, and you can't really manage that. Uh, sometimes a bunch of people just show up and there's no way to predict it, no way to influence it, it just happens. And then the, uh, the last one is assignable variation. This is variation that has identifiable sources. So um, this type of variation can be reduced, eliminated by analysis and corrective action. So an example of this might be the cook always does something and um, let's see, let's say that um, whenever he's making a salad, he has to walk to the refrigerator get the lettuce, bring it out, um, and so a salad takes a long time. Well, an example might be, well, let's put a little refrigerator right next to the preparation area where he can have some stuff there. So he's getting ready to make a salad, he just opens the door. So that's an example of assignable variation where you know how long that's going to take, you, you, uh, you actually correct it. So variations can be disruptive to the operations supply chain process. They can cause additional costs, delays, shortages, poor quality, and inefficient work systems. So this is the scope of operations management. Um, operations management runs across the organization. So um, it, it includes a bunch of interrelated activities and we're going to go through all of these in detail in this course, but forecasting, capacity planning, facilities and layout, scheduling, managing inventories, assuring quality, motivating customers, uh, deciding where a location is for facilities, and more and more. So it's a very broad topic. So the role of the operations manager. So the operations function consists of all activities directly related to producing goods or providing services. So the primary functions of an operations manager is to guide the system by making system design decisions and system operation decisions. So here's some system design decisions. So how much capacity do we have? Are, are we going to have a really large restaurant with a big kitchen or are we going to have a small corner restaurant with just a small kitchen? So that's a capacity example. Facility layout. Where are we going to put the refrigerator? Where are we going to put the stove? Where are we going to put the customers? How, how is the... Um, uh, all of those things. Uh, facility location is are we going to put it on Main Street or out in the country? Product and service planning. What is it that, how are we going to um, cre create this uh, product or service? Uh, acquisition placement of equipment, that's similar to facility layout, but you know, where are we going to get big equipment, little equipment? And so these system design decisions they're typically strategic decisions and they often require a long-term commitment of resources. If you're going to buy a, uh, all the equipment to go in a restaurant, you might uh, sign a long lease, you might build your own building, all the equipment, and it really determines the parameters of the system operation. What kind of restaurant, those kinds of things. So the system um, operation decisions, they tend to be um, tactical and operational. It's the management of people. When are people coming? When are they going? How many people do we need? Is Do we need to fire someone? Do we need to hire someone? Inventory management and control. How much lettuce are we going to buy? How many tomatoes? 
um, how much do we have on hand, how much did we throw away because it got rotten, uh, scheduling, uh, the scheduling of people, the scheduling of your hours, uh, the scheduling if you're developing a product, the schedule to develop that pro product, uh, project management if you're going to try something new managing that product project, uh, quality assurance, uh, making sure that whatever it is that you're providing is quality. So operations management tend to spend more time on system operation decisions than on any other decision area, but they still have a vital stake in system design. So these are the operation management decision making. Most de uh, decisions involve alternatives and might have quite different impacts on costs or profits. So the typical operations um, decisions include what, when, where, how, who. So the what, what resources are needed and what amounts, when, when will each resource be needed, when should the work be scheduled, when should materials and other supplies be ordered, the where, where will the work be done, uh, how will this product or service be designed? How will the work be done? How will the resources be all allocated? And then who? Who will do the work? So those are all decision-making questions. So here's a general uh, approach to decision-making, and that is to use a model. So a model is an abstraction of a reality or a simplification of something. Let's say that you you've never had a restaurant um, and you want to try different layouts. You might go into your garage and you say, okay, what if we put the server right here, we put the refrigerator over here, and you might practice making some things. That would be a model. If you made like cardboard cutouts of the table or maybe some folding tables and chairs, that's a model. It's a simplification of reality. You could have a computer model where you actually um, uh, analyze things with a computer. So the, the, the features of models, they're simplifications of real life. They, import, they omit unimportant details and they mim mimic so that the attention can be focused on the most important aspects of the real life system. So um, that, that's conceptually what a model is. So the keys to successfully using a model is you have to ask these questions. What is its purpose? How is it used to generate re results? How are the results interpreted and used? And what are the model's assumptions and limitations? If you don't understand that, if someone comes into a meeting and says, we ran the model and it said we should not build a store on Main Street. It's like, okay, what was the purpose of the model? Well, the purpose of the model was not location analysis. It was something else. Or how did you generate the results? So you can actually use a very good model in the wrong way and get bad data out of it. So the benefits of the model, it's easier to use, less expensive than the real system requires users to organize and sometimes quantify information. It really increases your understanding of the problem. Uh, it enables managers to analyze what if questions. Um, it serves as a constant tool for evaluation and provides standardized format for analyzing a problem. And it enables users to bring the power of mathematics. So if you have a mathematical model, um, you can bring a lot of power with that. Okay, let's talk about the systems approach. So a system is a set of interrelated parts that must work together. So the, the business organization is a system composed of subsystems. You have the marketing subsystems, the operations subsystem, finance subsystems. So those three subsystems are all working together. The systems approach emphasizes the interrelationship among the systems. The main thing is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, 
the output and objectives in an or organization can take precedence over any one subsystem. So marketing may say, hey, we got this great campaign, we'll bring in double the customers. And operations says, we can't manage that, that number of customers, so let's scale back on the marketing. And marketing is like, but we had this great marketing campaign. And it's like, well, for us to be able to do that, we would need to increase capacity. So then they go to finance and say, can we increase capacity? It's like, well, we don't have the money to buy the, the, the um, system to increase capacity. So in this case, marketing um, cannot do their super marketing. They, they may do a little bit more. Maybe you could operations could handle 50% more, so they, they tweak that marketing to bring in 50% more customers, not 100% more. Uh, then establishing priorities. Um, there, there's certain issues or items that are more important than others. So by recognizing these important priorities, um, you can focus on the efforts that will do the most good. Um, there's never enough time, so you focus on what is the most important. So there's something called the Pareto Phenomena. Um, some people call it the 80-20 rule. What it is, is 80% of your problems or events comes from 20% of the sources. So if you have 10 employees, 80% of your problems with those employees will come from two of those employees. So 20% of the, prob of the um, problems will come from, no, 80% of the problems will come from 20% of the employees. So the critical few factors should receive the highest priority. This is the concept that is appropriately applied across all areas and levels of management. So here's the historical evolution of operations management. There was the industrial revolution, scientific management, human relations management, decision models and management science, and the influence of Japanese manufacturers. So the industrial revolution, we talk about this um, before the industrial revolution, it was really a craft production system. You had a blacksmith and that blacksmith would make everything in his blacksmith shop. You had a dress maker who would make the entire dress. So then the Industrial Revolution, um, some key um, elements, uh, really in the 1770s, 1776, 1780, 1796. Um, so it really started in England. You had division of labor by Adam Smith. You had the rotative steam engine in the 19, uh, 1780s, and you had the cotton gin and interchangeable parts by Eli Whitney. Um, the management theory and practice did not really advance during this period, but there was this industrial revolution. Then we got to this scientific management, and there was this in efficiency engineer, Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he believed in a science of management based on observation, measurement, analysis, improvement of work methods, and economic incentives. So management is responsible for planning, selecting, training workers, and the find the best way to perform each job. So you have to uh, have cooperation between management and the workers and you separate management activities from work activities. And the emphasis was to manage or maximize output. And we got to that human relations mu movement. This, uh, it started uh, with uh, Gilbreth with the application of psychology. And then you have uh, Mayo who did the Hawthorne studies on uh, worker motivation. Uh, this, this was an interesting one where they, they studied productivity and lighting. And 
they they increase the lighting and uh, and uh, productivity went up and then they decreased the lighting and productivity went up even more and and it, it didn't make sense but what they realized was it was because management was paying attention to workers that the productivity was going up so that's the Hawthorne study Maslow's uh, you may have heard about motivation theory his hierarchy of needs um, and then the two-factor theory um, and then theory X theory Y and then it, in 1981 you had theory Z Now you have decision models and management science. So this is where you start really modeling mathematics. So Harris in 1915, he had a mathematical model for inventory management. Um, and then you started having statistical procedures for sampling and quality control in the 30s. Uh, Tippett uh, had statistical sampling theory, 1935. You have operations research. Um, groups and then that operations research got applied to warfare and then um, the last one is linear programming in uh, 1947 the Japanese had a huge in influence on quality um, and they're credited with, with the quality revolution and they also um, really started this concept of just-in-time production. So some of the key issues for operations managers today are economic conditions. Is the economy going up? Is it going down? Uh, how do I use that to predict? And there's innovating. Uh, what's happening? Uh, how are you going to make something new? Quality problems. How, how do you make sure you have good enough quality? Uh, how do you manage risk? and then competing in a global economy. You hear about that a lot where, um, hey, my job got exported to China or something. Uh, it, it, that is really the global economy. How do, you, how do you manage competition in that environment? Environmental concerns. So sustainability, and this is using resources in a way that does not harm the ecological systems that support human existence. And it can go way beyond traditional um, environmental and economic um, measures, um, really, to incorporate social criteria in decision making. And all areas of the business can be affected in the product or service design, customer education programs, disaster preparedness and response, supply chain waste management, outsourcing decisions, all of those have sustainability implications. Then ethical issue, issues, uh, financial statements. You hear about uh, CEOs going to jail for um, lying about the finan finances. Worker safety, um, maybe uh, someone gets hurt and you have a class action lawsuit um, or, or, you know, how, how do you um, how do you face a family member when you intentionally ignored some safety item and that that worker was killed um, or hurt? Um, product safety. What if uh, you sell a product and, and someone gets hurt? Um, hear a lot about airbags where there's defective airbags that hurt people. Quality. Um, is it... Is it ethical to sell things that are low quality when you know that it's low quality and you pretend that it's high quality? Uh, the environment, are you dumping things into that, that pollutes rivers um, that would, if you were caught, would send you to jail? Um, community, uh, maybe the, how are you dealing with the community? Hiring, firing workers, are you ethical there? Closing facilities, um, closing a facility in one town and moving it to another town, what does that do ethically? Worker rights, all of those are ethical is issues. 
So the, the supply chain management. Um, early on, there was little effort to manage the uh, supply chain beyond your own operations and immediate suppliers, um, which leads to numerous problems. You have oscillating inventory levels, inventory stockouts, late deliveries, and quality problems. So the issues, you need to improve operations. Um, we have increasing uh, levels of outsourcing, uh, increasing transportation costs. You have competitive pressures, increasing globalization, uh, the importance of e-business. So if you have a store and you're selling a product, you are directly competing against Amazon. If Amazon can give that customer that product in two days um, for a cheaper price, you're competing. And if unless that customer needs it today, um, you know, you're competing with e-business. The complexity of supply chains. Your supplier may also be serving your competitors. <coughs> Excuse me. The need to manage inventories. So um, there's different strategies, and we'll talk about this in more detail, where you might have your supplier manage your inventory um, and work together with your supplier. So a summary. We've talked about uh, the definition of operations management, define the difference between a goods or services, the supply chain, uh, the transformational process, historical evolution of operations management, uh, 